Yep, I am ready. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, warm welcome to all of you again uh, to the Well Tech Talk. Uh, the today's Tech Talk is on API recommended practices for downstream oil and gas industries, Part Two by Pradeep Goswami. The earlier one was a very interesting one. So, let us hope to have another excellent session today. Regarding uh, uh, Pradeep. He is an international welding engineer having 37 years of experience as welding and metallurgical engineering specialist. He is based out of Canada now and uh, his expertise involves in material selection, welding recommendation, mm -hmm. corrosion engineering, condition monitoring related to offshore oil and gas production and process refining, chemicals and petrochemicals power plants. He has a very strong knowledge of welding, metallurgical and QA standards for pressure vessels, exchangers, high pressure piping and pumps and valves for refining and petrochemical offshore oil and processing and nuclear power plants. With this short introduction, I invite uh, Mr. Pradeep Goswami to take the uh, session forward. Yeah, over to you. Yes, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Good morning to many of you and maybe good night to some of you also depending <laughs> on wherever you are. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's nice to be back after a break of uh, two months. The first part was offered in May, and uh, now the second part is getting it would be offered today. Uh, I hope uh, you had liked the first part, and uh, I would definitely like to continue on the same note for the second part of this uh, lecture session or the tech talk. So, so just before we start, uh, one small uh, announcement. Uh, first of all, this Weld Tech talk is uh, now being sponsored by Sigma. Sigma Weld, today an image is not uh, around. And uh, second thing, uh, we are also uh, com coming up with a paid course on uh, corrosion. The details are available with Sachin, so those who are interested can please contact Sachin for, for me, uh, more details. Yeah, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, into, uh, in the last session, I had talked about API RP 934A. Uh, 934A was uh, on uh, the material and fabrication practices for uh, basically hydroprocessing reactors uh, involving two quarter chrome, two quarter chrome, um, uh, one moly vanadium, and three chrome, and uh, so basically the chrome moly vanadium steels, uh, which are typically used in the hydroprocessing reactors uh, and related services. Uh, the second was on RP 934C, that is typically one and quarter chrome half moly steel wall pressure vessels. Uh, those are made for hydrogen services and typically hydro, hydro treater or these equipments which are off, uh, operating in the refineries uh, fall into that regime. Uh, today's uh, lecture uh, would be on RP five uh, five eighty two. That is where API RP five eighty two. That is welding guidelines for uh, chemical oil and uh, various downstream industries. Uh, and RP nine thirty four E nine thirty four E is an extension of nine thirty four C. That is basically it is on chrome moly steels, uh, one and quarter chrome half moly steels, basically uh, meant for services above uh, eight, uh, 825 degree Fahrenheit or uh, four, 440 degrees centigrade. Now, uh, RP 934E is uh, a, a very specific, uh, uh, you know, uh, recommended practice, which it doesn't cover much of the, uh, which doesn't cover a wide perspective. So uh, what I'm planning to uh, do, start is that I'll first go ahead with RP 582, that is, uh, which offers a very broader perspective uh, on various welding recommendations for, um, you know, oil, gas, and petrochemical industries. And uh, after this is over, I'll switch to uh, RP 934E. Uh, that would be followed by a question and answer session at the end of the talk. So to start with, uh, I'll go ahead uh, with the, with my presentation or the presentation slides. And uh, this particular uh, RP or recommended practice 582, this has got various scopes. Uh, in fact, this is uh, this particular uh, RP is now being uh, 
uh, rewritten uh, under uh, it is uh, being redrafted by api and there are quite a few interesting uh, chapters added onto this uh, but you know in a short uh, lecture like this uh, it is difficult to cover everything so i scan through as 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 much as possible and as well as the important aspects uh, of this rp in uh, you know in my lecture so as you can see here the what i am going to talk about are the scope of this rp and you see in your screen that uh, things are general welding practice uh, practice uh, general welding requirements welding processes i'll talk about weld consumables welding considerations and some cases like uh, specific cases like carbon steel for hydrofluoric acid service, dissimilar metal welding, low alloy steel welding, austenitic stainless steel welding, duplex, uh, duplex stainless steel welding. That's also, uh, I mean, that is a very interesting topic. Uh, uh, I mean, everywhere nowadays. Preheat interpass, post weld heat treatment, repair of a uh, post weld, uh, uh, I mean, uh, repair of a post well heat treated, heat -treated component without uh, or, or a service uh, or a component which had been in service for many years without post well heat treatment. That's an interesting area. Um, and uh, as you can see here, as you can see here, this RP provides the supplementary guidelines for welding and welding related topics for shop and field fabrication, repair and modification of the following equipments. These equipments are vessels, exchanges, piping, heater tubes, and pressure, various pressure boundaries, uh, pressure boundaries of rotating equipments and the attachments. It covers tanks and attachments also, non-removable non internals for the process equipments, and structural attachments as well as uh, uh, structural attachments related to process equipment. RP582 is a broad and generic guideline and is intended to augment the welding requirements of ASME, um, you know, um, uh, section nine and similar code standards and specifications and practices. That means what is this, uh, what it means is that ASME section nine will will be there as uh, if if it is chosen as a qualification code for welding procedures, but RP582. Will, when it is specified, when, when it is in place, it would be there and it will supersede or it may supersede the requirements of section nine. And that is based on the mutual agreement of the client, uh, of, the, um, of the vendor and the client, and uh, as well as the process, uh, as well as the project requirements. RP582 applies to chemical, oil and gas industry, pipe welding, offshore structures, and nowadays many industries are also coming forward to adopt that code as a general guideline for welding in, in their respective areas. This document is based on the industry experience and any restriction and limitation may be waived or augmented or augmented by the purchaser as required. That's an important clause that basically a lot of things, uh, I mean, a specification like uh, RT582 when it tries to cover all aspects of uh, various materials involved, um, not all the technical issues can be covered or can, can be addressed in one document. Uh, but, uh, but what happens is that if there are any restrictions uh, or are needed or it is thought it is to be thought that it is uh, or it could be waived that is the, depending on the mutual agreement between the purchaser and the fabricators concerned or the engineers concerned now no, uh, normative references the as you can see here that all the applicable API documents, API 510, API 934A, API 934C, 934E, ASME Section 8, uh, Div 1, uh, that is uh, Section 1 for uh, ASME Section 8, um, ASME Section 1, that is Rules for Construction of Power Boilers, then ASME Section 2, Part C, Section 8, Section 9, then B31.3, uh, and uh, all these uh, boiler pressure vessel codes, they are kind of in, uh, you know, attached to or um, they reference as these, uh, uh, these RP582. At the same time, various ASTM specifications also, ASTM A578, you can see here in 932, E562, 
those are specific applications. Uh, those are specific uh, ASME, uh, I mean, ASTM specifications. They are also addressed or there uh, in this specification in this RP. And there are many AWS standards also. You can see here uh, AWS. Uh, there, there, there's a huge list as well as AWS D1.1, D1.6 structural welding also. That is also encompassed uh, in this code or in this specification in this RP. Uh, to continue, we can see that the NACE MR 0175 and 0, um, uh, 0103 that is also addressed here. Uh, as well as a um, NACE SP 0742, uh, you know very well MR 175 that had been there for many years, I would say for ages, basically that is for the oil and gas upstream uh, oil and gas, uh, I mean uh, requirements, uh, I mean welding and metallurgical requirements for the oil and gas industries, uh, upstream industries, whereas 103 is for the downstream industries, and as well as you can see that uh, NB National Board NB23, that is NBIC repair code, boiler inspection, uh, um, uh, boiler inspection repair code, that is also addressed uh, by um, encompass this particular specification. So, in a nutshell, in a nutshell, this RP is uh, quite um, the application regime for these um, RP is quite broad. And it has been more or less accepted by uh, various industries and it had been tied to many design and fabrication codes. And uh, what it says is that uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, the welding maps or similar guidelines or weld procedure specifications, et cetera, all these things definitely are, uh, um, I mean, documented and basically structured requirements for any, uh, any, any you can say the welding uh, process or, uh, or any welding program, which uh, has to be there to be in place for fabrication of any process equipment or any boiler pressure vessels. So to continue, uh, well, let's see what are the welding process uh, these uh, RP has tried to address. The typically this RP has tried to capture capture the general uh, very commonly applied welding processes like, like Schindler metal arc welding, gas tungsten arc welding, or uh, and GTAW, which could be straight uh, GTAW or it could be pulse GTAW term uh, you know denoted uh, with, with this nomenclature GTAWP. Uh, Gas metal arc welding with solid wear and metal core arc welding for the following transport mode, that is spray, short circuit arc, pulse, globular. All four methods, they are also addressed uh, or allowed by uh, this RP. Other transfer modes approved by the purchaser, uh, that is uh, applicable for gas, trans um, uh, what do you call, for gas metal arc welding. Uh, it addresses uh, or it allows submerged dark welding, it allows uh, uh, electro gas welding, it allows electro slag welding, uh, limited, uh, but the application of electro slag welding is limited for overlay only and uh, for weld overlay only and that uh, that is for P1 to P5 and P15, basically the all ferritic based materials. It addresses flux code arc welding, it addresses plasma arc welding and other welding process as approved by the purchaser. Uh, generally, what uh, um, so generally speaking, these are this, this particular RP tries to capture or try to address um, or recognize the applicability all commonly uh, applied welding processes. Now, limitation of fusion welding process. So it it's it specifies that the fusion welding processes which were listed in the previous slides are acceptable and with certain restrictions uh, as on when needed. And uh, uh, some of them are very specific, like for GTAW pulse, what it says is that for the root pass welding on single-sided joint, GTAW pass, um, GTAW uh, pulse should be per shall be performed with the same make and same model of the equipment using the same program setting as used in the procedure qualification. And, GTAW machines shall be equipped with the arc starting device, 
and you can see that there are various uh, i mean uh, th there are various features which uh, requires to be built in into these machines now question is the why so what is the concern uh, to me what it looks like that uh, the concern is that what they feel is that the need to specify the make model program equipment setting and pulse waveform is based on the effect that these variables have if, uh, se severe effects on welding arc performance, especially sidewall fusion and out of position welding. And studies have shown that the considerable arc characteristics uh, uh, can, uh, uh, there could be considerable variation in the arc characteristics when the model or the make is changed. And this variation can lead to welding defects and some of which may be difficult to detect using radiography and even in specialized uh, ND like ultrasonics. Now, to many people, uh, to general, uh, from the general opinion, um, this may look uh, slightly overkill. But uh, what happens is that nowadays welding equipments come with lots of features, lots of intricacies, and uh, they are sometimes difficult to operate and difficult to, you know, uh, predict also how they are going to perform. Um, that is, uh, how's, how, how it is going to differ or the performance going to differ uh, between the procedure qualification and actual production joints. To get over that issue, they recommended that basically try to stick to the same make and same type of equipment and use the same program setting, you know, uh, what you use for procedure qualification versus what you use in the um, production yards. Then let's go see what is there for GM, um, um, MIG, um, straight MIG welding or uh, sorry, the short circuit MIG welding. It says basically, uh, which is denoted as uh, GMWS. It tells that this process shall not be used for branch branch connection, nozzle welds, socket welds. It may, uh, may be used uh, for root pass welding on piping. For root pass welding, GMWS uh, for other application is provided, uh, provided the root pass is um, you know commonly removed after back gouging. Uh, or from the backside, the fill up, the fill and the cap passes may be uh, welded with this process, provided the thickness and the uh, thickness doesn't um, exceed um, uh, three quarter, uh, three eighth of an inch, or, or roughly about nine nine and a half millimeter, um, half millimeter, and the vertical welding is uh, performed in an uphill position. Uh, the GMWS or short circuit GMW generally is not a very conducive process for any production welding, but it is again uh, very much uh, popular for uh, for thin wall pressure vessels, and that is why uh, that that is why RP five eighty two allows this with certain restrictions. It talks about then let's see about the GMWP that is GMW pulse welding. It tells that GMW pulse welding may be used for any material thickness in any position. Welding shall be performed in the same make and same model of the equipment and using the same program setting as used in the procedure qualification. That's also straightforward. That means basically whatever machine or whatever equipment you try for procedure qualification, better stick to that in the production in the production giants also. Flux code arc welding, the self-shielded flux code arc, flux code arc welding, you know, it comes in two versions, that is self-shielded and gas-shielded. So FCAWS is the self-shielded arc, and it says it may be used only for welding of carbon steel structural items. The following guidelines and restrictions apply. Electrotypes identified, et cetera, shall be for the multipurpose application. Only Electrode classification, which have the minimum impact test requirement, shall be used. And FC, FCWS shall not be used for other welding process uh, uh, with, uh, with other welding process without qualifying the specific combination. Uh, Self-shielded arc welding generally is a very popular process because uh, shielding gases, uh, I mean, especially for the field application, uh, <coughs> the um, it, 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 it keeps a very good uh, performance in the field applications and it is quite popular because uh, shielding gas coverage can, be, can become a problem when people are welding in the open. 
And uh, as you know very well that the shielding is provided by the, by the core or the flux which is used in the core. So that is why all these uh, specific requirements are there. And FCAW with the external shielding gas, that is FCAWG may be used for groove and fillet welds for pressure boundary and structure welding. Specific brand make trade name of consumable used in production must be qualified uh, on supporting PQR with impact test. And uh, res uh, results meeting the minimum design code requirement. And what he talks about is that basically flux code arc welding is a good process. It can be used, but the main issue or one of the very uh, bugging issue with flux code arc welding is that when you when you, when you specify flux code arc welding for a joint uh, uh, involving impact test, there is a strong possibility that it may it may not meet the requirements. So that is why the specific uh, finger pointing is that, yes, you can use the consumable, you can use the um, uh, specific equipment, you can use a specific setting, but you know, what you, what you uh, use, whatever you use, um, make sure that you have these consumables are tested um, or, or they comes with the impact test certificate. And uh, flux core dark welding, it tells that uh, this flux core dark welding gas shielded shall be limited to, to the ASME AWS classification um, as used in the PQR. And for pressure, um, for pressure containing equipment where the wall thickness uh, exceeds three, three eighths of an inch, the diffusible hydrogen content, that shall be as specified. You see here that basically H4, H8, uh, H16, these are very common. Uh, H4 and H8 are the generally, I would say those are the um, uh, criteria which are sought after by uh, uh, by all the fabricators as well as the designers for uh, boiler pressure vessels involved in the oil and gas industry. And next to look at is that electrogas welding. Electrogas welding is a very specific process and, uh, you know, I mean, it's not very popular or not commonly used everywhere, but wherever it is used, it can be, uh, I mean, it can be used provided it meets a certain specific guideline as specified here. <coughs> Submerged dark welding is a very popular process, is a very popular process for pressure vessel, uh, any, any, any shop fabrication, as well as for field fabrication also in cases. And, it tells that SAW procedures can be requalified when the welding flux is changed from one manufacturer's trade name to another. That is very specific because you know very well that in subarc welding, the uh, the heart of the subarc welding is the flux. And uh, uh, once you change the flux, definitely, uh, definitely, you know, a lot of things can happen. So a change of flux, uh, De definitely is uh, uh, will necessitate the requalification of welding procedure. Now, again, it, uh, uh, next clause is that it tells that different fluxes with the same classification can re uh, result in different and unanticipated weld properties. Hence, the flux interchangeability as per the welding variables should be very specific and uh, shall be um, shall be carefully controlled. Preferably, should be avoided. Should be avoided without uh, requalification. Uh, the interpretation of this clause is that, you know very well, uh, ASME or AWS has got a wear flux classification. So say like uh, wear flux classification of one particular uh, supplier um, says, comes with a uh, specific requirement. Now, if the supplier A gives you the wear flux classification and uh, there is another supplier B which gives the same wear flux classification, assume that your um, well procedure was qualified from with the product supplied by supplier A. Can you use the supplier B's product in production? The answer is no. Basically, uh, that is uh, in-house uh, quality control or quality assurance uh, related issues. And basically what he says here that 
better avoid that and unless and until you become sure that flux A and flux B, uh, I mean, where flux combination A and B gives you 100% values and if you, those values can be uh, established, established or ascertained only after doing the, uh, uh, you know, qualification or procedure qualification. And about summer duck welding, uh, it tells that basically uh, the SAW fillers sh uh, shall not be uh, substitution or shall not be done without any requalification. And uh, so in a nutshell, there are quite a bit of strictures in place for uh, all this weld process. I mean, basically, as you know, that this change or flexibility of weld processes are there, but provided you run in a disciplined way that you basically qualify them before application in actual production work. And combining weld process, et cetera, that is as per as allowed by the court. Um, another aspect is the mechanized and automated weld process and orbital uh, weld processes are very popular nowadays and similar automated weld process, they require separate programming and um, def definitely, uh, ASME section nine addresses a uh, lots of variables and basically what it tells is that, yes, this is very popular, it can be used, and but you need to stick to the guidelines of ASME section nine, as well as, uh, uh, I mean, especially this QW461.9 for essential variable for procedure qualification. And basically try to stick to the equipment and the make and, you know, once you are happy with a particular machine or particular um, type of equipment, try to stick to that uh, in the actual production welds. Um, next comes the welding consumable filler and fluxes and fluxes and fillers. Uh, basically, um, as you know, these are as per ASM section to Part C and uh, AWS and uh, uh, testing, et cetera, are very specific and they should be there in place and they're mandated by uh, uh, section ASME, ASME code as well as that is supported by RP582. And uh, it tells that well metal toughness shall be certified by the filler metal manufacturer and, um, uh, and that has to be there in the MTR or the CMTR and procedures using any combination uh, which is classified as a G. Uh, G uh, stands for, you know, a general classification and where the composition can be changed or can be altered or it could be subject to the, uh, you know, mutual agreement between the client or, or the project requirement. And it tells that basically if you're using if you try to uh, do not try to flip flop uh, welding consumables with the G classification, if a G class under this classification, if a certain brand or a certain type is used for PQR, that should be applicable for production welds also. And uh, welding consumables shall be identified by the trade name, etc. These are very common, uh, you know, uh, requirements for procurement and classification of welding consumables. Now. Welding considerations. Um, there are lots of things to talk about in this RP, uh, but for due to the time constraint and you know um, and the nature of this talk, I try to extract some of the relevant uh, you know uh, common applications of application issues or common experiences what uh, fabricators come across. So first, first in this line is that. Welding of carbon steel for hydrofluoric acid service. Uh, hydrofluoric acid or HF alkyl alkylination is a very common process in the refineries. And uh, API RP571 is, uh, the, uh, is the recommended practice which provides the guidance on the filler metal selection and various other welding practices. So, what RP582 tells that well, you need to re, uh, look at the requirements of RP751 for filamental chemistry for welding carbon steel uh, in the hydrofluoric acid service. And uh, there are restrictions of copper, nickel, chromium, uh, and this concentration uh, should not exceed 0.158%, and the carbon should not, um, should not be more than 0.18%. 
and the root and hot patch shall be welded with uh, uh, gas tungsten arc welding using copper free welding consumable and uh, for repair welding and tines uh, which had been exposed to um, hydrofluoric acid service a 650 to 600 uh, to 650 degree Fahrenheit or 300 uh, uh, in the range of 300 degree centigrade hydrogen breakout is recommended. <clears throat> While this is not universal, it is generally recommended that post well heat treatment of uh, carbon steel for hydrofluoric acid service is mandated. And uh, when it is mandated, is that basically there is a hardness restriction for this kind of service of 200 uh, Brunel max. And this 200 Brunel max is often difficult to meet or difficult to achieve, you know, in carbon and low LR steels following fabrications. And, you know, very well, those are, uh, these hardness is affected by lots of things like base metal chemistry, well metal chemistry, then the heating and cooling cycle and uh, experience during welding. So there are lots of issues involved. So in order to achieve this 200 Brunel max, a post weld heat treatment is better to be imposed uh, and uh, make sure that if the hardness does not exceed 200, uh, 200 HP for these hydrofluoric acid services. Uh, dissimilar metal welding. So in this case of dissimilar metal welding, uh, these dissimilar metal welding is addressed from uh, P number one uh, to P through to P number four five and to p number 15 and from uh, you know these p number one to p number 15 there are n number of there are endless number of carbon and low alloy steel um, low alloy steel materials and welding of those involved may involve welding um, i mean dissimilar welding between these alloys uh, may involve welding to them to martensitic stainless steel, to ferritic stainless steel, or to austenitic stainless steels, and, uh, and on. Now, typically what uh, this RP tell, uh, specifies that type 309 or 309L may be used for design when the design temperature doesn't exceed 315 degrees centigrade or 600 degree Fahrenheit. And uh, nickel based alloy filler metal may be selected when the design conditions are shown in the in the next, I mean, um, are shown, which is shown in the next slide. Uh, use of dissimilar materials, welds, carbon or low alloy to st austenitic stainless steel in service uh, services, uh, where which could be corrosive to carbon or low alloy steel, cash shall be carefully evaluated. What it means is that suppose you have a service and you are you are trying to adopt a dissimilar weld. If the fluid is corrosive to carbon and low alloy steel, and uh, you need to you, you need to be selective. You need to think about this whether you need to adopt. We should be adopting a dissimilar weld in such an environment. Now failures have been reported due to hydrogen charging. Uh, you know, if the hardness is high during the fusion uh, uh, adjacent to the fusion line which is very common uh, problem in any dissimilar material welding uh, failures have been reported it is unclear when the uh, and as well as what happens is that when there is a dissimilar welding there is always a possibility of a galvanic uh, action uh, being in place or a galvanic coupling in, being in place and when there is a, a, there is a presence of a galvanic uh, you know weld in an in a corrosive environment, there is a possibility of forming uh, hydrogen charging. Also, there are uh, there are there are. Uh, I mean, there are verified evidences to that. In addition, carbon and low alloy steel to austenitic stainless steel welds may be susceptible to brittle fracture when they're exposed to the surfaces uh, below um, uh, minus twenty nine degrees centigrade. So in a dissimilar welding combination, one has to think about lots of pros and cons. Now, these are, as, as I was talking about in my previous slide, that these are the recommendation from, uh, by AP, R, RP582 on the selection of uh, nickel-based consumables for a dissimilar weld. 
So you can see here that there are three cat there are a few categories. The uh, typically straight inconel 82 or 182, and we have got um, uh, 625 type of welding consumables. So for 182 type, you see here that when the sulfide when the environment is a non-sulfidation uh, type or uh, does not involve any sulfidation, the <coughs> allowable temperature, design temperature is 540 degrees centigrade. And when it is a sulfidation environment, it is reduced to 370 degrees centigrade. For, uh, for 625 type, it is 592, uh, it is 590 degrees centigrade. And uh, when the sulfidation is there, it is 480 degrees centigrade. Now, the issue is that, uh, generally speaking, uh, what is sulfidation, right? If we refer this API 939C, that tells specifically what is sulfidation and what, what are the pros and cons or what are the so-called <coughs> the dangerous uh, steps or dangerous stages involved in any sulfidation environment. So generally speaking, uh, when the, there is sulfidation involved, uh, in any application, one has to be very selective. And this particular regime is the applicability of uh, the nickel-based consumables. And uh, when, the, when the environment is non-sulfidation type, say for a power plant environment, yes, one can have the flexibility of using these nickel-based consumables for higher temperature services also. Generally speaking, as I mentioned earlier, dissimilar metal weld is, uh, it, it requires some thoughts uh, beforehand and uh, definitely there are design related issues and not only design related, I would say that there are quite a bit of service related issues also down, um, you know, down the road. So that's why one has to be very careful and very selective about the selection of the welding process. <coughs> welding consumables and application of those in service. And uh, next to talk about is uh, the low elastic welding. And as you can see here, P, P number three to P5, uh, um, uh, down to P15E, which is an, um, you know, P91 steel. And it says that basically, typically guidance is like API 934A, 934C, and 934E shall be followed for chrome molly steel for pressure vessels for high temperature, high pressure hydrogen service. We have talked about 934A, 934C in our previous <coughs> lecture session. Uh, 934E is the one which I couldn't cover in the last session, and I'll uh, talk briefly about that today. And uh, it says specifically that for uh, P15E, that is nine chrome one moly or P91 material, welding consumable, the nickel plus manganese, that is, uh, that shall not be, uh, shall, shall not be greater than 1.2%. Uh, there's a very specific requirement for that, why it is so. Uh, uh, we'll talk about that later in, uh, in, you know, in the later slides. When he talks about the stainless steel welding, there are lots of stainless steel welding involved in any process industry and any petrochemical refining industry. Anywhere you talk about austenitic stainless steel uh, is very common. So as you can see here, there's a broad um, uh, table which tells basically that, uh, uh, you know, say for an example, which gives a layout or gives a spreadsheet of the materials to be welded versus the consumable to be welding consumable to be chosen. Say for an example, if you choose type 316 uh, to type 316 and uh, 316L, 317L, what are the type of welding consumables you can choose? Uh, if you see that is provided in this particular table, and you can see here that basically uh, type F, okay? Type F can be, as you can see here, is straight 316, or if you are welding 316 to 316L, it could be F or G. And you can see here that F is, as I mentioned earlier, is type 316. G is type 316L. Uh, 
so that's that is the way that one can have some idea of what to choose basically this is a, this is a first step in selection of any welding consumable and later definitely as you know that there are various other parameters uh, various other aspects one has to look through uh, before you put them in service and that is called a good welding engineering practice and uh, it talks about uh, the general restrictions and it says that basically for austenitic stainless steels, uh, um, typically unless and otherwise specific, uh, otherwise, uh, unless otherwise specified, for materials requiring post-weld heat treatment or materials in high temperature service, the ferrite number shall not exceed 10 Fn and that should be measured before post-weld heat treatment. And uh, the ferrite measurement shall always be taken prior to any post weld heat treatment. The maximum ferrite number deposited, uh, the minimum ferrite number deposited for weld should be 3 Fn and measured uh, uh, prior to post weld heat treatment. For minimum uh, 347, the minimum ferrite number shall be 5 Fn. This may be reduced to 3 Fn provided the fabricator has uh, the data and the test reports um, ensuring that the hot cracking is not going to occur. And as well as for stainless steel in cryogenic service, uh, as, well, uh, as well as for stainless steel in cryogenic service, the non-magnetic -mag applications, the lower ferrite number that is uh, your 2 Fn may, may be required. Now, there, there are, uh, it's an interesting uh, aspect. You see here that there is a minimum ferrite number and there is a maximum ferrite number. Now, minimum ferrite number is always required in austenitic stainless steel, as all, um, all of you know very well, to avoid any form of hot cracking. So, you need to ensure that the ferrite number, uh, minimum ferrite number is met. At the same time, you've got to ensure that you do not exceed a certain value so that after post weld heat treatment, there are ch chances or uh, I, mean, not, uh, um, I mean, not only post weld heat treatment, when these components are put in service, <coughs> there could be a gradual transition or <coughs> formation of sigma phases. <coughs> so that is why, <coughs> sorry about that, that is why one has to be very specific about uh, this well metal involving ferrite numbers. And uh, it is critical and it is now, nowadays it is almost a cakewalk for any consumable manufacturers and it is a proven practice and established practice. So that way, if you buy the welding consumables from a reputed supplier, they do not, uh, I mean, it, it is not a big issue nowadays. Next in line is the duplex and uh, super duplex stainless steel. Uh, the super duplex, uh, duplex stainless steel for the downstream industries is a fairly new phenomena. I'll say that in, I mean, not very new. I'll say that for over the last 20 years, slowly, slow, very slowly, they have uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, these duplex stainless steels have made its inroads in the downstream um, uh, oil and gas as well as uh, process and petrochemical industries. Now, for many years, these requirements were very dormant and they were not much uh, talked about. And uh, But uh, what RP582 uh, over last uh, um, two, three publications, I would say from 2016 onwards, in the last publication which they had, they have tried to address duplex in a very systematic way. So let us see what he talks about. Welding is of duplex stainless steel is always more complicated. And this particular uh, RP, there's an annexure, annexure D, that addresses the duplex stainless steel welding in a very detailed way. And procedure qualification requirements, including ferrite testing and impact testing when it is man, uh, I mean, is considered mandatory. Uh, consumables and, uh, uh, and as well the deposits shall meet the requirement in table three. That is the next, uh, next slide, and which I'm going to show. Uh, some much dark welding shall always be done with the basic plugs. Typically, basicity in this should be two, uh, two and above. And uh, 
two and above two is very uh, i would say less generally speaking people go with uh, more than two so it is two to two and two and a half but you have to be very specific because there are not many uh, uh, fluxes available or recommended for sub arc welding of duplex stainless steel and basically whatever <coughs> the manufacturer specifies or whatever they formulate uh, with the proven values, it's better to stick to that. Pillar metal and fluxes used in the qualification shall be from the same manufacturers and manufacturer's trade name, uh, and <coughs> that should be used from the, uh, for the production. <coughs> what he says very clearly is that, basically when you are uh, qualifying the weld procedure with a, say, brand say like a from a uh, uh, reputed manufacturer say let's uh, let us take the name of uh, metro if you are qualifying the uh, uh, procedure with the metro products better stick with the same product in your production wells also do not try the equivalence uh, theory for duplex stainless steel <laughs> and uh, um, why this is so because this material is not uh, easy to use. This material is not uh, is unpredictable, and so are the welding consumables also. And you can see here that uh, there are few other restrictions. Any change in the backing gas composition uh, composition shall be considered as an essential variable. Now, you know very well that backing gas is just for the purpose of protecting the root, right? Uh, and that's protecting the root from oxidation, which is not an essential variable in uh, carbon low alloy steel as well as in austenitic stainless steel also. But for duplex stainless steel, this is an essential variable. And <clears throat> so is the essential variable is the shielding gas also. The oxygen content of the backing gas or the purging gas uh, definitely has a very low or a very strict requirement. And uh, you know very well that even many cases, clients may, uh, clients may ask for much lesser value than what is specified in this RP. Shielding and back purging gases shall be argon or argon nitrogen mixture and other shielding and back purging gases may be used if it is approved by the purchaser and established in the PQR. Now, you know very well that argon or nitrogen is a um, common uh, shielding gas, uh, shielding and purging gas uh, combination used for duplex. But if yes, there are other gases also that's called formia gas, which is argon plus hydrogen. Or if you try to use argon plus helium, right? Whatever you try, whatever you want to use, you got to prove. You have to, uh, in your, uh, uh, you know, you need a separate uh, procedure qualification or a PQR for that. And over and above that, there are additional requirements for duplex. It tells basically <coughs> that nitrogen, um, the weld metal definitely has to contain nitrogen. And this nitrogen, these are the typical values. And nickel and moly definitely will, will be at this at these level. Now, as you know very well, these are very generic guidelines. If you look at the manufacturer's uh, catalog, you find more details about duplex uh, and uh, super duplex welding consumables. So here is a broad guideline. Uh, if you if you have to wear lean duplex, standard duplex, super duplex, and hyper duplex, and if you're welding <coughs> lean duplex, you see that the recommendation is the to use the consumable for standard duplex that is 2209. And uh, if you uh, because lean duplex typically use a, um, a material where which is an offshoot of uh, standard duplex here nickel and moly is on the lower side but one can be happy or one can comfortably go with the consumably recommended for standard duplex for while welding lean duplex also and for standard duplex we have year 2209 and 2209 is very common uh, classification it uh, uh, we know very well and uh, for super duplex we have got 2594 so 2594 basically stands at 25 chrome 9 nickel and 
four moly and 2209 is 22 chrome and uh, uh, you have nine nickel. Uh, so that is a kind of a broad layout of uh, the uh, uh, welding consumables, which are recommended for lean, standard and super duplex. And hyperduplex is something which is uh, very, uh, you know, typically the chrome content in this in, uh, is above 27%. There are two varieties available with 27% uh, and 32% uh, chromium. And uh, hyperduplex is very prone to ferrite as well as sigma phase transition. And uh, it's not that everybody can handle this uh, hyperduplex, so that is why uh, they have left it to the uh, manufacturer or the supplier of welding consumables. So it's better to go with their recommendation. And you know very well this hyperduplex products are manufactured by one or two specific companies. And it's better to seek their opinion and their recommendation when you are dealing with a hyperduplex uh, in any oil and gas uh, downstream applications. <laughs> And uh, you can see here also that it talks about the specification E2553. E2553 is a specification where uh, you apply copper on a typical, uh, uh, you know, super duplex common, um, uh, composition. <coughs> Why copper? Because lots of duplex and super duplex are getting used in the sulfuric acid industry and duplex and stainless steel has proved to be a very effective and very reliable uh, and cost effective material in the sulfuric acid industry and, the, and generally speaking, uh, copper is added I mean, over and um, over and above the no normal duplex stainless steel composition. So that is why this this composition is there. Now, going by this uh, recommendation of this RP, these are the typical guidelines for uh, procedure qualification ranges. And as you can see here, say if the <coughs> thickness of the coupon is one inch greater than one inch or 25 millimeter for lean grades the maximum allowable uh, qualified thickness is 1.2 t that is say like if you take a 25 millimeter coupon the maximum thickness qualified is 1.2 t that is 30 millimeter for straight duplex it is 1.2 and for what you call the i mean for um, and for the super duplex, say like 25 and 27 chrome, this range is reduced to 0.5 to T. So that means basically they are very restrictive about uh, the thickness requirements. Now, in this case, one may see that yes, if I am uh, qualified, if my qualification is code is ASME section 9 and I have RP582. So which is going to be my governing thickness for qualification? I would say that it is RP582 because RP582 is over and above SME section 9 requirements. Yeah, <coughs> sorry about that, just having a little bit of problem with the choke bias. But anyway, continue. And these are the ferrite test requirements for duplex stainless steel, any piping joint. And you can see here that these are the typical uh, requirements or the orientation of, um, you know, ferrite, ferrite testing. And uh, this slide talks about the typical uh, maximum uh, or the maximum interpass temperature which is allowed for duplex stainless steels and as you can see here you know uh, as the thickness goes up the restriction there is to uh, you know quite a bit of restriction there in place uh, but rather uh, as the thickness goes down i'll say that quite a bit of restriction is there is in place because <coughs> 
you want to prevent the uh, chances of overheating. So that is why the control of <coughs> interpass temperature becomes essential. So you can see here that 100 to 120 degrees centigrade uh, is generally the rule of thumb. And, uh, you know, that is the value which is kind of uh, approved for all applications and generally followed as a, uh, um, I mean, as there is standard requirement for welding of duplex stainless steels. This table gives the guideline for the welding consumables. That means you can see that basically if it is, um, Duplex 31803, which is the workhorse of duplex uh, stainless steel family. Um, and to be well, uh, and if this particular welding is going to be between uh, 22, I mean, standard duplex 22 chrome, and this is 22 chrome duplex, the uh, allowable selections are A to D. As we have seen for the austenitic stainless steel, this is a similar kind of a, uh, you know, uh, chart. And when you see A to, A to D, what is A to D? A is basically 2209, that is our conventional 22 chrome duplex. And uh, D is unclassified duplex material, that is DP3W, that is a, a very specific uh, requirement, uh, very specific type of welding consumable. And <coughs> as you can see that, uh, when you have the duplex to something like a uh, P8, the recommended uh, consumables are AEF. So a AEF, when you go here, A stands for 22 chrome duplex, E stands for 309, and AF stands for 309 LMO. So that means basically for a dissimilar, the so, so the basically the, uh, I mean, rule of the game is that when you are welding duplex to duplex, you got to uh, you have to stick to the exact composition uh, what is mandated. If it is a dissimilar combination between duplex to stainless, you have the flexibility of using either an austenitic consumable or a duplex consumable, depending on what are your procedure or what are your service or design requirements. So selection uh, of duplex consumables is very tricky and uh, generally it requires a very good understanding of the material and the welding uh, processes and uh, definitely uh, uh, I would say the welding metallurgy down the road. So in a nutshell, I would say that these are, these are a brief, I mean, these are a few brief summary of uh, uh, on welding of duplex stainless steel. And as you can see here, that over a period of time, lots of duplexes are now being used in the, uh, in the uh, refining petrochemical and various other process industries. So adoption of these requirements of RP582 definitely would be fruitful and uh, that would provide nice guidance to the welding engineers and the other design engineers involved. And, uh, Next, uh, these are general, um, I'll say the commentaries on preheating and interpass uh, temperature control. Preheating, as you can see here, whenever required, uh, it has to be in place. And uh, for preheating control, there are various, uh, various documents uh, or various guidelines in place. There is section A Deep one, uh, we have section B31.3, and we have got these API specifications as well as the 1.1. So depending on which code you follow, where, what is the design code uh, or uh, specification in place, you got to you have the flexibility to adopt the recommended preheat. But again, that particular preheat is only the recommended one. Uh, whatever is followed in during the procedure qualification or uh, you know, establishing the PQ or that becomes mandatory. Now, uh, preheating generally is required for all low alloy steels and it, uh, it is to be maintained uh, until the post weld heat treatment is uh, completed through the entire thickness and uh, certain welds they call for dehydrogenation heat treatment or DHT um, that is uh, 
a common occurrence or a common recommendation for welding low and uh, low alloy steels these days. And uh, as you can see here, uh, these are the rec maximum recommended interpass temperatures. So you can see for the carbon and low alloy steels, uh, carbon steels typical recommendation is <coughs> 300 or 315 degrees centigrade for duplex. Uh, I mean, there are various materials involved for P8. <coughs> the maximum is 175 degrees centigrade and for uh, other materials like P5A, P5B, and P15A, um, um, I mean P91, uh, low alloy steels, it is maximum 315 degrees centigrade. But again, as I told you that this is only a guideline, but uh, you have to uh, devise the preheat as well as the interpass temperature control based on your uh, uh, project specification as well as the you know, various requirements uh, as mandated by the contract. And post oil heat treatment, uh, definitely post oil heat treatment uh, is a must and post oil heat treatment should specify the heating rate, holding temperature, holding time, maximum uh, cooling rate. And uh, uh, <coughs> post oil heat treatment is very specific and it, uh, uh, you know, nobody, uh, nobody should try to cut corner when post oil heat treatment is in place. And uh, post oil heat treatment generally is not mandated for austenitic stainless steel, duplex or super duplex stainless steel and non-ferrous alloys, but certain type of post oil heat treatment, say like solution annealing is, is needed or may be needed for these uh, steels when there are specific uh, requirements and those definitely require the purchaser's approval. Now, if you have already uh, if you have to repair a component which has already been post oil heat treatment, but without any further post oil heat uh, further for, further post oil heat treatment, that uh, you need to follow a specific uh, requirement. Uh, it's a very it's a very tricky situation. It may happen for components which is there uh, following for new component after following fabrication or it could happen for uh, components which had been in service for many years and there you need to follow the nbic or api 510 uh, requ the requirements specified in this particular course and uh, this is a table which talks about the typical post oil heat treatment uh, which are recommended by uh, rp 582 as you can see here, the minimum uh, temperature, say look at carbon steel, the minimum temperature, which is recommended by a SME section eight is 1100 degrees centigrade or 595 degree Fahrenheit. But you can see here, this range is, wide, a range is higher. That is 1100 to 1200. And you can see here that basically for all carbon steels, for all carbon steels, right, for the various services as shown here, it is generally in the range of 1100 and above up to 1200 degrees centigrade, uh, up to 1200 degree Fahrenheit. And for one chrome, as well as uh, two quarter chrome, one moly, and as well as for th these steels, Generally speaking, what happens is that these are the uh, recommended holding temperature. Now, <clears throat> it may happen that these temperatures definitely would be more than ASME uh, or the specified design and fabrication code. So the question may come, which to follow, ASME or API? Well, API, as I said before, that it is, exclusive to oil and gas industries. So if the equipment gets, I mean, apply, uh, the application is for oil and gas industry, basically the recommendation of API 582 should be there in place. And, and that's, that, that's the post welding heat treatment, uh, I mean, post weld heat treatment temperature one has to follow. 
And continuing the same line, you can see the recommended post to heat treatment cycle. So you can see for nine chrome wall moly or, or P91 material, this is the post to heat treatment. And there is uh, additional uh, notes on uh, API uh, 938B also, that is, uh, you know, that's, that's exclusive. This RP is, uh, I mean, uh, not RP, API technical report 938B is exclusively on nine chrome one more than ADM steel. And uh, there are certain uh, notes also, uh, as you can see here, I mean, there are lots to talk about, but uh, I just kind of, a, you know, uh, highlighted one or two interesting, uh, interesting observation. So it says basically that uh, for nanchrome or moly uh, vanadium steel, it is necessary to cool the wells before uh, to below MF, that is uh, 93 degrees centigrade or 200 degree Fahrenheit prior to performing post well heat treatment. This is required to maximize the austenite transformation to martensite. Austenite that is not transformed before, that is not transformed before post well heat treatment will transform to martensite upon cooling from the post well heat treatment and will lead to high well hardness. For utility services, PWHT soak time typically is less than the process services. And it says that you may have to cross refer that if this API TR 938B for more details. Well, uh, just a very, uh, this is a general note, but there are lots of uh, technicalities involved. And in my earlier uh, presentation on exclusively on 9 chrome 1 moly or P91 steel, which I delivered last year, I have talked about that. But to make sure that basically that uh, when you weld the P91, you have to, you have to cool, you got to make sure that you the weld following uh, uh following welding the welds are cooled below this particular temperature that is 93 degrees centigrade or 200 degrees fahrenheit and then only one uh, for uh, one kind of a you know goes ahead with the post weld heat treatment and other operations and basically what happens is that this p91 gives the best property in uh martensitic condition that means it has to be martensitic and it has to be tempered properly and that is not achieved properly below if i mean that is not achieved properly unless the wells are uh, cooled right up to this temperature in one stroke following the welding and the last topic I, I'm, I'm going to talk about is repairing on an in-service component without post-weld heat treatment now, what may happen is that uh, this is an interesting topic. In a in a way, what may happen is that sometimes post weld heat treatment following welding uh, may have potential adverse effects on equipment and piping. Now, if this is applicable for many static and rotating equipment which had been exposed to thousands of hours of service life. Now, what may happen is that if, say, for an example, if you have a component which had been there for many years. And all of a sudden that component has got a failure, it develops a crack. You cannot throw away the component, but you have to do a weld repair. And now if you're doing a weld repair in, in situ, it is not always possible for you to do a post weld heat treatment of the entire component, or it's not possible for you to do a post weld heat treatment of the particular uh, area which is being repaired. That is controlled by, I mean, why? Because those are controlled by various factors, location, the uh, the, uh, the life of the component. That means if the component had been in service for many years and it had already gone through many, it has taken severe beatings over uh, say service life, then, then what happens is that uh, weld repair of those components can be very tricky. So that is why control deposition welding or temper bin method is generally applied. So as post weld heat treatment is not advisable, a, a thorough evaluation of the design and operating parameters need to be done and basically before uh, adoption of this technique. Uh, by and large, what happens is that 
it's my opinion also this tempered bit method method should not be tried on brand new components without being sure about what are the uh, i mean what could be the effects down the road for brand new components yes if there is a possibility of doing a uh, repost well heat treatment uh, after any repairs is better to do that rather than going for control deposition or temper bit method but again that is subject to a engineer's discretion and that requires very careful evaluation before being put in service because post weld heat treatment is a very serious uh, step in any boiler pressure vessel fabrication control deposition or temper bit method is a substitute when there is no post weld heat treatment is feasible but control uh, but uh, this is not and uh, I mean, this cannot replace post-world heat treatment just, uh, you know, uh, in totality. So how this method is executed? Say like if you have a defect or any kind of an area which is showing defect, you gouge it out like this. Uh, try to make it a, uh, you know, try to make an area where at least you, you are able to have a wider roof for depositing the welds. And again, this, this is typically the weld configuration which one has to follow during the procedure qualification also. So what you do is that you, you have a buttered layer. I, I will not say buttered layer. You have a layer deposited in this fashion using typically low, I mean, low dye electrode, typically 2.4 millimeter dye. If it is by stick electrode process, typically 2.5 millimeter, 4 millimeter dye is used for this first layer. <clears throat> once this layer is deposited and once you have done a hot magnetic pass, uh, hot NPI uh, to make sure that there are no cracks or there are no weld defects, then follow with the deposition of the second layer. So as you can see here, the first layer is here. The second layer deposition of the second layer starts at a, uh, you know, it, it, it covers 50% of the first layer. That means what happens is that when you deposit the second layer, the, the heat input in the second layer, that's going to temper, a part, if not fully, at least partly, this first layer that means when layer 15 is deposited on layer one or I, I mean when bit number 15 is deposited on bit number one the the heat input of this bit is going to temper the welds of b well be deposited in uh, you know well deposited in bit one so that is the logic behind this so one has to be very careful and one has to be very specific about uh, the deposition technique or deposition methods. So that is the way one has to build up the entire layer and uh, entire welding sequences. So that is why temper bead is, uh, it requires lots of thoughts and lots of care for, um, lots of care and lots of observations before application. And, uh, Temper bead is uh, the term which is adopted uh, uh, generally by industry and uh, um, National Board or NBIC NB23 is very commonly adopted for that. And uh, when it goes to API 510, this technique is uh, specified as CDW or Control Deposition Welding Technique. And this is generally considered to be an alternative to post weld heat treatment. And, uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, so the first layer, uh, uh, I mean, the, the, the heat input of the first, second layer, that refines the first layer. And generally the uh, rule of the, I mean, the rule of the technique is that use 2.4 millimeter or 2.5 millimeter entirely for the first layer. For the second layer, switch to the bigger dye that is 3.15 3 or 3.2 millimeter and progressively as you go for the next layers like uh, uh, you know this uh, as you can see the uh, well well deposit within this cavity 
you can switch or you can stick to four millimeter dia for these layers. Do not try four millimeter dia on the second layer or do not try four millimeter dia or 3.2 millimeter, uh, I mean four millimeter dia right in the first layer. Because if you use a higher in heat input in the first layer, the base metal underneath, that's going to be, I mean, that's going to affect the base material. That material, material is, uh, you know, uh, in, a, in a service or, or aged component, this material, the base material may be in very bad shape and that may kind, kind of develop problems uh, down the road and as well as when you, when you are doing the welding. So, as I mentioned here, uh, earlier, uh, that uh, basically uh, before doing the CDW or before doing the temper bead, one has to assess or one has to know the base metal chemistry first, and it has to be addressed through a procedure qualification uh, process as per SME section nine, generally QW 290, uh, you know, provides the guidelines of what, how to do a temper bit qualification and how to, uh, what are the tests to be adopted. But again, a note of caution that temper bit is not at all a 100% substitution for complete PWHT. So that is why one has to be very selective and very careful and very, uh, you know, uh, you need to assess all the scenario and then only jump into these uh, or conclude whether you are going to adopt temper bit process for uh, any weld repair or not. And uh, for CDW or temper bit, generally these are the codes and standards followed that is, uh, um, Section 9 QW 290, ASME Section 1, then you got uh, ASME Section 3, the nuclear code, and uh, as well as ASME Section 11, that is alternative building methods. That is, these uh, Section 3 and uh, Section 11 basically are followed for the nuclear components. Then for the petrochemical uh, side, we have got API 510, and um, as a matter of fact, NBIC, National Board Inspection Code, this had been there for ages and this was a technique, this was the code which is which had been used for repair and restoration in service. That means basically for weld and welding and repair of in-service components. So NBIC, to be, to be frank enough, NBIC is the code which uh, adopted uh, this um, temper bead uh, method as an, as an alternative to post twelve treatment. Uh, or, and that is later down the road, all other, all other codes also adopted this. Rather, NB, um, I mean, so that means basically NBIC or, uh, I mean, temper bead method is now more or less a, uh, common and adopted practice by various uh, various courts, and but there are certain, certain restrictions where there are ch chances like environmental cracking, or I would say that uh, uh, you know things like uh, sour service and environmental cracking. Then one has to be very careful about the CDW or uh, temper bit methods. And uh, these are typically the codes and standard followed. As you can see here, if the depth of the um, groove is typically T or uh, what, um, you know, the repair qualified is less than T. That means basically what happens that if you do a qualification on a 15, uh, 50 or two inch thick, and uh, you can see that uh, what is, uh, the thickness of the base material qualified is uh, slightly lesser than that. So basically what happens is that uh, you have to just uh, uh, assess how much is the thickness involved and accordingly you have to co qualify the uh, procedure in, in the same fashion. And uh, last in this annex uh, is uh, in RP 582 uh, annexure F, this has go this, this talks about P91 welding. There are lots of things to cover under this P91. Quite a bit of information uh, is, uh, you know, uh, covered under this annexure. So that is, uh, I, I mean, these are a quick, uh, this is a quick snapshot of those. So, I mean, 
basically, uh, if I would have uh, wanted to cover this, and definitely, I would have needed uh, a few more, a few hours, a uh, couple of hours. But uh, due to the time constraint or due to the nature of this, uh, I would like to say that uh, these are the typical changes or typical, uh, uh, you know, new. I mean, new information which one can expect in the um, um, newer version of RP 580, 582. And uh, it would be good to talk about this in future uh, if IW, uh, you know, plans to organize any kind of uh, detailed uh, lecture session on RP 582. Definitely, I would like to come forward with more information and definitely there'll be lots of questions and definitely those question and answer sessions would be, will do a good brainstorming for the entire welding fraternity as well as the other people concerned. Yeah, we will, so, we will surely work out a program on this maybe for a couple of days, you know, in the coming uh, months. Yes, yeah. thank you very much. Yes, uh, and that is, uh, we, uh, uh, with this presentation, uh, I have come at, uh, at the end of my RP 582. And uh, now, I mean, I, I don't want to give a break. I would think that it's better to continue and end. Uh, yeah, there are some 12 questions in the q and box. Okay. So we probably can address all those at the end of, the, end of my lecture, right? Would that be yeah. good? Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay. So now I, I'll kind of uh, jump into my next uh, uh, presentation topic that is API 934E. Okay, I, I hope that is acceptable to everybody. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, I mean, thinking about giving any break because I wanted to finish this and then- yeah, we'll I think we should, we should continue, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, yes. Uh, are you able to see my screen? Hello? Yeah, yeah, yeah proceed. Yeah. All right. Uh, this part of this uh, uh, lecture session is on API, API uh, 934E. 934E, uh, sorry about uh, actually it should be 934E. 934E talks about materials and fabrication of one and quarter chrome and half moly pressure vessels for service about 440, 440, 440 degrees centigrade or 825 degree Fahrenheit. So in continuation, uh, the recommendation of these uh, are in line with uh, uh, API 934A and 934C. Uh, what we discussed earlier, rather I would say 934C, because 934A is a lot more detailed. It deals with uh, many other materials, but 934C talked about uh, the same material, but for a lower service, uh, lower service uh, application regime. And uh, what is uh, what this uh, 934E talks about is that it's a RP for which involves one quarter chrome half moly and one uh, one chrome half moly steels for uh, for vessels exchangers and for elevated temperature service. Uh, they could be fabricated to design uh, section A deep one or deep two, and. Also, this document may be used as a resource when uh, planning to modify the existing pressure vessels also. Uh, these vessels may be, may have an austenitic stainless steel uh, uh, or ferritic stainless steel or nickel alloy overlay or cladding. 
uh, if they are, then uh, they are there to provide additional corrosion resistance. As a matter of fact, and uh, generally speaking, everybody is aware of, and many fabricators are also come through those experience in chromoly steels, when the thickness goes up and goes above four inch and above, there are issues with uh, uh, meeting the toughness requirements. Uh, why this is so? Basically, there's a lot many things to talk about. And basically what happens is that, uh, you know, uh, the, the issues are there that molybdenum, half percent molybdenum is not adequate enough to keep the notch toughness. Whereas if the moly can be increased instead of half, uh, it can be increased to one or so, right? Probably you can get a good notch toughness. But again, there are other service issues also, uh, which ASM doesn't want to change probably. So to, to summarize, when you are using this particular material uh, for a certain, for very higher thickness or for a greater thickness, uh, I mean, greater than four inch or now, there could be some toughness issues. So that is basically, that is why this 934E typically recommends that the, you know, the designer sh uh, restrict the wall thickness to four inch, uh, I mean, below four inch. And if a particular example requires the design wall has to be greater than four inch, two using two quarter from one molly alloy may be a better option. And, uh, these RP is intended for, as I mentioned, that uh, uh, the service temperature, uh, the design temperature should be between 440 to uh, 620 degrees centigrade. And uh, the, uh, sorry, the, that's the operating temperature between uh, 440 to 620 degrees centigrade. The major issue in these uh, service could be low, low creep ductility or LCD, low creep ductility cracking. And LCD or low creep ductility cracking is, is typically a form of reheat cracking. Uh, typically reheat cracking means what happens is that it doesn't form when it is fabricated, it doesn't form when it is post-weld heat, uh, post heat treated immediately after welding, but it may form uh, in service or it may form uh, during, uh, sorry, it may form during post weld heat treatment also. Now, what happens is that uh, these equipments are typically, uh, which are uh, um, the equipments where these, uh, these RP is used, the CCR catalytic reforming reactors and FCC fluid as catalytic uh, uh, cracking units. And, uh, There is a component which is very well known in the industry called coke drum, and that undergoes a severe cyclic operation due to the form uh, when the decoking operation is in place. So coke drum is fabricated as per maybe fabricated as following the guideline of 934E, but since um, one man's, one can say since they operate at temperature <coughs> above this, they could be fabricated adop uh, adopting RP nine thirty four E, but uh, coke drums have got a severe service implication. That is why API decided to adopt a, another technical report that is nine thirty four G for the coke drums. Well, uh, this is a very specific uh, cases and, uh, you know, uh, it requires a typical uh, evaluation of uh, before these components are fabricated and put in service. And what are the materials typically covered by this RP, uh, this RP 934E? These are one and quarter chrome half moly and one chrome half moly and one and quarter chrome. We have got 387 grade 11, class one or class two. And one and quarter, uh, one chrome half moly. We have got grade twelve, class one, and class two. And uh, the steel making practice, as it talks about, the steel making practice generally shall be um, uh, vacuum degassing is a must. And uh, uh, 
uh, vacuum degassing definitely ensures that the harmful gaseous con uh, co constituents are if not 100 per if not thoroughly but they removed from the uh, from the melt to a very great extent and the steel which is uh, kind of you know uh, the chemical analysis uh, of, of the steel sh shall show that basically the x bar shall be below 15 ppm and x bar you know very well that that's a summation of the so called the tramp element which one gets uh, during any melting uh, in any composition that is phosphorus antimo uh, antimony then uh, 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 phosphorus then an antimony arsenic as well as tin and this value x bar should be below 15 ppm that applies for the base metal as well as we'll see later for the consumable also uh, typically this is a nominal composition and uh, uh, i mean as per asme section 2 part a uh, typically the heat treatment of these steels could be either they could be annual they could be normalized uh, i mean grade 11 grade 12 if they are used uh, when they are used in service they could be annual they could be normalized and tempered or they could be quenched and tempered or they or alternative another form which is very popular these days is normalized with uh, with accelerated cooling and tempered and that is termed as N plus AC plus T. <coughs> now, uh, when uh, what happens is that, uh, and also specifies if the thickness is greater than two inch or so, then these particular uh, heat treated place, quenched and tempered or normalized uh, and accelerated co uh, cooled as plus tempered variety, that may require specific fracture toughness. Uh, um, I mean, Basically, I mean, these treatments are needed when the fracture toughness specifications are very well specified. Now, tempering uh, temperature may be below and above the post well heat, uh, heat treatment temperature that is adopted in the mill. And tensile test, basically, uh, Tensile uh, testing is a must and uh, test coupons shall, uh, for all these type of um, combination, they shall be heat treated to represent the maximum post well heat treatment. Um, what is the maximum post well heat treatment defined by this specification? It specifies the heat treatment that is aggregate time and temperature of test specimens to simulate the maximum heat treatment exposure of the vessels. The test coupons initially with the same austenitizing and tempering heat treatment as the support supplied material are heat treated at a temperature and at a time that simulates all fabrication and heat treatment above 900 degree Fahrenheit. And this includes the intermediate stress leaving and all post well heat treatment cycle and post well cycle, etc. etc. So you can see here this is a very broad definition, uh, but each and every line is important. And you note here that dehydrogenation and DHT does not include or is not to be included as the too low to a temperature to affect any uh, material properties. So for these vessels, if there is anything like an IC, ISR, intermediate stress leap, or anything like a post well heat treatment, that has to be addressed. And basically, uh, that probably has to be addressed in one continuous cycle, and that is termed as the maximum post well heat treatment. Charpy impact test requirement, that is a must, that is mandatory, and that should be performed for all these steels, uh, all these grades, uh, and basically what the temperature and what, uh, what, I mean, what temperature and what is what are the accepted values that should be adopted by the code as well as uh, that is as per the code or as per the design specification specified. Now, typical, uh, how do they come? And this is an uh, uh, extract taken from the, uh, I would say the data sheet of uh, Industrial or Arcelor who are making, who, who makes this plate in, you know, uh, with great precision. So you can see that this particular is the brand name, Chrome Elzo 11. Uh, and you can see these are the nominal uh, composition. And as you see here, that 
this comes with the uh, these are the nominal tensile values. This is the X bar. X bar values uh, that is uh, less than 15. And Charpy impact test temperature is typically minus 18, de 18 degrees centigrade or uh, zero degree Fahrenheit. And uh, other, it says that basically these are, you can follow this particular ASME or API guideline for additional uh, requirement. Uh, and here, what do you see here? This is a summary that uh, this is the uh, better snapshot. So that is for uh, grade 11 and material. What do you see out here is that these are the nominal composition. The heat treatment is quenched and tapered. Uh, you got the J factor or you can give it by X bar also. X bar should be less than 15, 15 what we specified, talked about earlier and post well uh, maximum as per the customer requirement, that is this maximum post well heat treatment cycle, what one um, the meal has to do as a simulation that has that should come from the project specification or from the customer. Uh, there is a factor called LMP, that is Larson-Miller uh, parameter, that is the tempering parameter, that is uh, how much of how much of uh, you know tensile values are lost or uh, kind of uh, you know reduction when there is a uh, what do you call tempering done or post well heat treatment done so that is the Slauson Miller parameter and uh, it tells basically what are the API specification this steel can meet that is 934C and 934E and uh, uh, to go across the issue, these are the typical welding, uh, the requirements of the welding consumable. That is, you have the X bar, uh, less than 15 ppm. And uh, as, I, as I mentioned earlier, the purpose of controlling these uh, are to uh, control the temper embrittlement, reheat cracking, and low, duct, uh, low crib ductility crack, cracking or LCD. Uh, these uh, and these uh, values needs to be ensured on the deposited weld metal on each batch of welding electrode, each heat of the filler wear, or each combination of filler wear and flux. Uh, you got to ensure that. And in addition, you need to have copper and nickel at these certain. Uh, uh, certain values basically to control these so-called uh, uh, reheat cracking. Uh, I mean, if copper and nickel are on higher values on a chrome moly steel like this, they may they they could be detrimental to reheat cracking and or low creep ductility cracking. Low hydrogen welding electrodes uh, definitely is a must and uh, maximum diffusible hydrogen is 8 ml per 100 grams of weld metal. Uh, although you know very well that eight, uh, H8 is, uh, although code mandates, but H4 is better to use and that is used uh, all across the industry. These are some of the, I mean, this is a quick snapshot from uh, one of the manufacturers called Covelco, and that is their brands of welding electrodes, which they offer for these kind of materials. And as you know, for sure, welding one chrome or um, uh, grade 11 and grade 12 is nothing magic nowadays, uh, because these steels have been getting fabricated for many years. But when you weld them in thicker sections and as well as with these API restrictions or API RPs in place, then definitely one has to, uh, one has to have very careful thoughts and proper welding process in, uh, procedure in place to meet all the design and service requirements. And welding heat treatment, uh, it talks about the general weld treatment, uh, general welding requirements. Uh, basically, all welds shall be full penetration welds, and as well as uh, they should be welded or they should be laid out in such a fashion that full ultrasonic examination can be made after fabrication and after the equipment had been in service. 
and it should be sufficiently smooth to facilitate any like uh, you know in, uh, magnet, uh, magnetic particle testing or or, uh, or penetrant or ultrasonic or radiographic as applicable and uh, well procedure qualification basically it should be with ACME section 9 and there should be some additional requirements uh, the additional requirements are this base metal and the weld procedure qualification that should be made from the same base metal specification and the same P number and the group number. That mean, uh, basically, if it is a grade 11, you should stick to grade 11. If it is grade 12, it's better to stick to grade 12. Um, I mean, that's, that's, my, that's the way I look at it. Uh, either plate or forging may be used for procedure qualification. The welding consumable combination that is wear flux electrodes, whichever are used on uh, procedure qualifications, the sh uh, as well as for the production welds also, should be the same type and say similar in chemical composition. <coughs> and uh, what to follow or what to mention, uh, I mean, what is to be followed following the welding? Uh, conventional, uh, as you know, that following the uh, post weld heat treatment, your tensile bends, uh, those are very common. In addition, the hardness has to be met. Hardness shall not exceed to 248 weakers. And transverse tensile shall be performed on its weld joints in heat treated place in the maximum post weld heat treatment condition. Uh, the maximum post weld heat treatment condition, as I specified, is uh, if I go back to my previous slides, this is the definition of the maximum post weld heat treatment. It says specified heat treatment, which is the aggregate time and temperature, aggregate temperature and time, and uh, of the test specimen to simulate the maximum heat treatment uh, exposures of this vessel. So that means basically you do not do this maximum heat treatment on the vessel. You do this simulation on the uh, on your test plates. That test plates could be your best metal, and for uh, if it is done for the whatever cycle was done for the best metal, the same cycle needs to be repeated when you qualify the weld procedure. So uh, coming back to the uh, place where I. Uh, where I was before. So that means basically transverse tensile shall be done uh, in the maximum post weld heat treatment condition. And uh, after post weld heat treatment condition, you, uh, I mean, Sharpie impact shall be done on the weld heat affected zone on the test coupon in the minimum and maximum post weld heat treatment condition. Uh, basically, minimum is the one which is going to be applicable for the vessel uh, that is, uh, you know, post fabrication heat treatment and maximum basically is the one which one can anticipate following the simulation and uh, adopting the ISR and other things also. So this minimum and maximum that needs to be specified at the outset, uh, at the very outset and that has to be, uh, and that has to be adhered to. So this is a cross-sectional view of how much, uh, how you carry out the hardness um, that as per this RP. And uh, Charpy impact definitely uh, shall be, needs to be done and it has to be there uh, at minus 18 degrees centigrade and the whatever values are specified in your code or the purchase specification that has to be adhered to. And, uh, Preheating generally is very common. 150 degrees centigrade is uh, the typical value as a, is a minimum, but one has uh, the flexibility of going higher than that. But again, yeah, this preheating and control of interpass temperature should kind of, you know, that should follow the, the values which were adopted for the procedure qualification. DHT, dehydrogenation heat treatment, uh, uh, if, if it is needed, it has to be done. And typically it is 300 degrees centigrade for a minimum of one hour duration. DHT generally is not uh, considered, uh, I, mean, the, I mean, the temperature is too low to 
cause any metallurgical transformation. So if somebody is qualifying a, a PQR with the maximum post well heat treatment uh, uh, time, the DHT, the time spent on DHT doesn't need to be included in the, in the PQR coupon. So production welding, uh, production testing of the best metals. So one has to do the chemical composition, one has to do the hardness deposit, and one has to do the weld impact test also. And other testing, if it is, if there is an overlay involved, these are the ferrite requirements. And uh, uh, the ferrite requirements should be between three to 10 FN. And if the, if the 347, SS 347 is used uh, as, an, uh, as an overlay, uh, then the, it has to be restricted between five to 10 FN. And uh, this bonding test, yes, since these vessels operate in a hydrogen service, this bonding uh, test generally can, uh, I mean, out of, uh, asking for the, the this bonding test seems to be logical, but what happens is that this RP doesn't uh, recommend this bonding test to be done for these, uh, for the equipments which are fabricated following these guidelines. Rather, this bonding test is asked for the vessels uh, which operate on much stricter or more stringent regime, that is uh, the hydro processing reactors, which are fabricated uh, as per 934A. Chemical composition, if the overlay is in place, uh, definitely it has to meet the chemical composition and it has to be, it, it has to be there, it, it is to be taken uh, and it has to meet the chemical composition of the, uh, as per the code. So the final post well heat treatment, post well heat treatment shall comply with the minimum requirement of the applicable code, uh, except that for one and one quarter chrome and these particular steels, uh, the weld joint shall be between 1225 to 1275 degrees centigrade, uh, degrees Fahrenheit, uh, which comes to 6, 660 to 690 degrees centigrade. Generally, generally this range is slightly higher than what is specified in <coughs> ASME section A, D1 or D2. Use of post well heat treatment higher than this code requirement helps to prevent reheat and LCD cracking. Uh, uh, this, uh, this is out of, uh, I mean, this recommendation is adopted in uh, this RP and that is out of uh, the experience gathered from the operating industry. So that is why they mandated that, yes, when you do the post well heat treatment, better stick to a higher temperature than what is recommended by the court. Post well at uh, this particular temperature, 690, uh, above uh, this 12, 1275 degrees centigrade, that is 690 to 720 degree can be considered when the primary failure mechanism expected in service to be creep. Uh, if you adopt this higher temperature regime, then what happens is that the vessel uh, uh, weld will get softer, um, the ductility will improve, but there may be sacrifice in the tensile values. And that, that's why it, say, it tells uh, clearly that use of this particular temperature may result in lower steel tensile strength and impact strength. But uh, whether to adopt a temperature of 12, post well heat treatment temperature of 1225 to uh, 1275 or higher than 1275 degree Fahrenheit, that is again a service induced in a phenomena and that recommendation should strictly <coughs> come from the end user or the client. The fabricated vessel shall be post well heat treated uh, as a whole in an enclosed furnace. Uh, if the ve entire vessel doesn't fit into a furnace, sectional post well heat treatment is allowed also. And uh, non destructive examination, uh, as you can see here, ultrasonic and magnetic particle, LPI, these are very common, as well as uh, um, radiography is there all the time. It, and uh, but ultrasonic uh, can wherever UT is possible. That means uh, I would say the phased ray or uh, you know or pout. Then 
uh, then definitely that that would be the way to go and it tells that ut may be applicable in lieu of rt when ut procedure fulfills, fulfills the requirement of asma section 8 dip 2 paragraph this uh, this particular paragraph and those talks about the uh, phase study of toft uh, as uh, the recommended rt uh, i mean recommended ut techniques uh, which can be used in lieu of radiography also and non less ND after final post 12 heat treatment, you can see here that basically it has to be done for the best metal welds, uh, weld overlay, and as well as there should be a positive material identification. And uh, this PMI should be done for if, if you are doing any austenitic stainless steel, uh, as a, um, if you're providing any austenitic stainless steel overlay. Uh, even for that matter, if the vessel is made of um, entirely made of. I mean, uh, one quarter chrome half moly steel PMI also may be specified to ensure that yes, welds uh, meet or exceed the chemical uh, the chemistry of the base metal. Uh, hydrostatic testing, as you know very uh, uh, very well, that it's a very I mean it is the ultimate test of any fabricated uh, pressure vessel. So. Requirements are that the test water shall not contain more than 50 ppm of chloride and during the hydro testing the vessel temperature shall be at least 17 degree above the MDMT that is the minimum design metal temperature or 15 degrees centigrade uh, whichever is warmer. So uh, that means basically what happens is that if the design temperature is a, uh, I mean, the whole thing is that the, the operating temperature of these vessels can be high, but you cannot do or you should not do hydro test at, at that high temperature. I mean, uh, that's not possible because the water will not be water when the temperature exceeds 100 degrees centigrade. So you have to do at a temperature which is uh, above the, uh, uh, I mean, which is above the minimum design metal temperature. So, and this minimum design metal temperature or 17 degrees centigrade, whichever is the warmer, that is the uh, mandate for this code. The vessel shall be drained and thoroughly dried immediately after uh, after the testing. That means you need to ensure that uh, you don't, there are no, leftover of traces of chlor chloride in the vessel and which uh, probably doesn't uh, cause any kind of pitting or you know uh, post fabrication damages which may uh, which may affect the performance of this vessel in service and these are called the preparation of shipping and basically uh, the vessel has to be nitrogen filled and then only it has to be shipped and uh, a tag has to be there with uh, showing that the vessel is uh, filled with nitrogen. And these are the typical documentations required for uh, these equipments. And those documents are the MTR showing all the chemical composition, mechanical test reports, the X bar reports for the best metal and chrome moly steels, well procedure specification with the applicable procedure qualification records. And uh, in addition to that, along with the, uh, the following additional test reports are required, that is the heat, uh, the post-12 heat treatment cycle, the, that is the, you know, showing the ramp time, holding time, uh, I mean, uh, and as well as the temperature and the PMI report and production test results if, uh, if this is required by the code or the specification. And uh, in a nutshell, these are the basic requirements for these uh, equipments. And I'm sure that many of you do come across fabrication of these equipments, uh, if not day in and day out, at least quite a few times a year, you know, or you have dealt with these kind of components, uh, you know, in your shop floor. So you know the things much better or in a more systematic way than uh, what these uh, RPs are talking about and the information could be at your fingertips. But certainly uh, the recommendations or what is mentioned in these RP 934E 
would help to enforce your knowledge base and so that in future if you get involved in fabrication of these equipments you know very well what are the things to look for and how to ensure the total integrity and total safety and as well as a, a i'll say a thorough 100 uh, percent you know uh, a thorough engineering of these equipments and put the good equipments in service so with uh, this i have come to the end of my presentation uh i think uh, is uh, it's 9 30 here in my in my watch and uh, uh, so probably I've spoken about two hours, nearly two hours. Uh, yeah, it's and, almost seven, 7 p.m. here, yeah. Okay. And I hope I have uh, tried to keep the audience uh, totally focused and totally yeah, engrossed in the lecture. And, yeah. And hope uh, you have enjoyed my lecture. And last of all, again, I will say thank you for your kind attention and participation. Yeah, so now I would say that uh, I can uh, open the session for questions and answers. Yeah, there are almost 16 questions. Okay. Uh, so do you have the questions? Yeah, you, you are able to see in the Q&A? Uh, just a minute. Yeah. On the top of the screen, there will be a small box Q&A. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Just click on that. You are able to see? Yeah, yes, I'm seeing that. Yeah, uh, the first question comes comes from Gerald James. He, def he is asking for defined hydrogen service. And some examples of uh, the process equipment involved uh, uh, involving the in, in this service. Uh, what I will say that, yes, uh, well, hydrogen service, when you talk about uh, uh, in the refining and petrochemical industry, anything which is coming across uh, uh, the hydrogen in, uh, in, in the service, right, uh, could be club, generally maybe defined as something like a equipment is service, hydrogen service, but that's not the reality. Uh, I would say that if you look at API 941, that is the steels uh, which are typically uh, denoted for, uh, recommended for hydrogen service, that will tell you exactly what are the typical uh, uh, definition of hydrogen service. But to, make, to be specific about hydrogen service, it has to be a specific uh, pressure or a temperature and as well as, uh, uh, you know, uh, the equipments involved. So typically, when you talk about the process equipments, anything in the hydro processing circuit in the refinery are typically called the uh, critical equipments in hydrogen service. And in addition to those, there are lots of other things. And but whether it is a hydrogen service or not, that the designer and the end user, the client, has to specify uh, in their tech spec or data sheets. Uh, so that kind of be that is that is my analysis and answer to the question. And uh, next question is that uh, from Gerald again. The reason for flux code not mating sharp impact is due to oxide inclusion. <clears throat> no, it is not the oxide inclusion. It is the oxygen, so-called the <clears throat> dissolved oxygen, which uh, is possible in a in, in a flux code arc welding because flux code arc welding can uh, uh, 
uh, needs strong deoxidizers to uh, to keep the dissolved oxygen in the weld uh, and uh, on a very low side. Uh, as well as what happens is that typically flux code arc welding consumable meets, uh, uh, contains uh, slightly higher carbon compared to a solid weld. So those are the attributing, major attributing factors for flux code arc welding in not meeting the Sharpie impact uh, requirements. Uh, in addition to that, uh, this carbon being slightly on the higher side can lead to higher hardness value of the flux code arc welding welds. Uh, and uh, that's why when you have to have a flux code arc welding in place, uh, you have to be very selective and you should not try to, uh, you should not try to go by the AWS equivalence all the time. Uh, you need to go with the so-called the uh, reputation or the established uh, facts about a particular brand of welding product. Say, if you talk about Cobelco, I have seen lots of good Cobelco, Hado, uh, I mean, flux code wares. They definitely have got a very uh, high, high degree of reliability. Of course, that doesn't mean that many other manufacturers are, do, do not produce that, but your, uh, uh, I mean, the selection should be based uh, not only on AWS specification, I would say, but it is based on your experience with various types of welding manufacturers also. Well, the third question is that the P15E is a P91 material. Is it possible to weld P91 using electro slag welding? Well, it's an interesting topic. Uh, I've, I've not come across but welding of uh, P91 with electro slag combination, uh, electro slag process. Uh, there are not many manufacturer, manufacturers who are giving the, where, uh, I mean, uh, so-called uh, the combination. But electro slag process can be used to, uh, I mean, to overlay typically nickel or stainless steel base uh, overlay on P91. But this process is not used for doing the butt welding or group welding on P91 welds or on P91 materials. The highest one uh, can go for is submerged dark welding. And uh, uh, few man, uh, not all manufacturers can give you the reliable consumable uh, uh, on P91. And you know very well that either Bowler or Metro uh, or on the eastern side uh, or eastern part of the world, if you go to Cobelco, right? Uh, rather, very few specific manufacturers who know this material in and out can only deliver the welding consumables. So uh, uh, to you know, summarize this question uh, and my answer, I would say that generally electro slag welding uh, is not recommended as a groove weld because uh, the, the hindsight are that it electro slag gives a very poor notch toughness. And if you get a poor notch toughness on P91, and if you do a, a renormalizing of P91, then it's the, it is going to kind of a mess the material, right? So that is why generally speaking, uh, electro slag welding is not recommended for welding P91 material, although it could be used for doing the weld overlay. Uh, <clears throat> Next question is for Gerald uh, James uh, again, that uh, in recent uh, uh, ASME 2021 20, uh, 20, edition, G classification lists most elements except few elements like carbon. Uh, please throw some light. Uh, well, I mean, uh, basically, uh, I, I would. Uh, I don't have any uh, clear answer for that. I would like to see some uh, evidences. But uh, G, as I said, as I mentioned, is not a classification across the board. G is something like an agreeable uh, classification between the supply between the consumable manufacturer and the end user. So. Uh, 
I would like to see some more uh, data before I could conclude. And if if needed, Gerald can write to me in my you know uh, can send me an email and I can answer to him in a uh, in a one to one way or you know if uh, uh, IW send me these questions, I can uh, draft an answer and send it to the committee so that they can circulate it to all the all uh, all the people concerned. Yeah, we will do that. Yeah, I will. Okay. Uh, next question comes from Mr. Raghuram Bathula. His, uh, his question is that, what is the recommended consumable for dissimilar welding in sulfidation at, uh, atmosphere where the temperature exceeds the recommended uh, temperature given in table, RP, uh, table in API 582? That means we have a design temperature of 550 degrees centigrade and uh, 347 to grade 22 to be welded. Uh, well, uh, I would say that using uh, your uh, uh, nickel-based consumable should be a better, uh, should be a good choice. If it is 347 to grade 22, if it is uh, a sulfidation environment, then I would think that using uh, 625 type of welding consumables would be uh, would, would be a good choice. But again, this issue can be looked into a, on a specific basis because if it is not, uh, uh, I mean, uh, we need to see the other parameters also before recommending what should be the a good consumable. But as a rule of thumb, I would say the 625 would be, uh, or ENI CRMO3 type would be a, a preferred choice. And, uh, there is another variety also. Uh, we need to see that if the Hesterloy type of welding consumable can be recommended or not, because uh, uh, I mean, but uh, I mean, as I mentioned that uh, this needs a little more uh, digging up the information and I can reply to those once, um, once I get this, uh, uh, I mean, question from IW. And uh, next question is that for stainless to stainless post weld heat treatment, uh, for stainless SSPWHT is neither required nor prohibited. Have you exper have you experienced stainless steel vessel with post weld heat treatment? Well, stainless steel post weld heat treatment is not very common. Austenitizing or uh, uh, solution annealing is uh, is common, uh, but solution annealing uh, generally involves a lot of issues because distortion, dimensional issues, um, that becomes paramount, uh, paramount importance. And, uh, you know, unless it is needed, nobody wants to go into that. But for uh, refinery application, there is something called uh, uh, stabilizing heat treatment. Uh, yes, I have come across specifications involving stabilizing heat treatment. And yes, stabilizing heat treatment nowadays is widely popular in uh, the refining industry because it helps to avoid a um, uh, phenomena called polythionic acid, uh, you know, corrosion. And uh, that is why many of these refining equipments, they are uh, for for, the, for those uh, equipments, uh, these uh, stabilizing anneal is recommended, but that needs to be specified in your purchase specification or <coughs> the project specification. Next question again is from Gerald. That's a nickel a nitrogen and moly content in the slides of DSS is applicable for. Uh, even S three one eight zero three or even S three two or three three double two zero five. That is two two zero five. Well, basically three one three one eight zero three and two two zero five. They are <coughs> almost back to back similar material. Almost back to back, I would say, because two two zero five was the first grade of duplex which came in the European market and. Uh, that was commonly uh, denoted as uh, with, the, uh, with this word SAF SAF 2205 because it confirmed to a Swedish specification and that was invented by uh, Sandvik. Uh, but uh, later uh, 
UNS 31803 was adopted by ASME and uh, the, you know, ASME and ASTM uh, court committees. So if you compare 31803 and 2205, they are almost back to back. Basically, the, the difference, major difference is that 3205 allows a little more carbon than 31803. So nitrogen and moly content, I would say that that applies for both type of materials. Uh, because uh, uh, typically this 803 and 2205, they are class clubbed under the same group. Uh, next question is from Mr. Uh, uh, Saravanan uh, Ranganathan. He says, why NICR MO4 specific for welding uh, Hestler 276 or uh, to stainless steel material? Can we use NICR MO3 filler for welding Hestler 276 to stainless steel if the PQR is qualified with Inconel 625? Well, uh, you need to see that on a very, it's, it's a very, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what happens is the C276 chemistry is different than your 625. I do not have the chemistry right in front of me. That's why I cannot comment. But the uh, requirement is that if you're welding C uh, Hesterloy to stainless steel, right, stick to a specification which is compatible to Hesterloy 276. Uh, 625 is, an, is a great uh, and a versatile uh, stainless, uh, I mean, uh, what do you call nickel chrome moly type of welding consumable, but uh, it may not meet the all your service requirements. I mean, PQR qualified means it may you may meet tensile and bends, but you may not meet the other properties like the corrosion and uh, you know other tests. So, uh, my advice would be to stick to the specification or uh, the consumable, which is near, which is closer to the composition of Hestral 276. But if you can, you know, share more information on this, then I can advise you in a much better way. Then uh, Mr. J uh, Gerald James again for P91 is cooling the weld above MF temperature permitted provided double tempering is performed. Uh, I would say no, uh, because generally, uh, generally sp uh, speaking, the cooling should be done uh, below MF so that uh, you get uh, as much martensite as possible. And uh, if you get uh, the, the more number, the more is the percentage or more is the content of martensite or as welded martensite or as cooled martensite in P91, better are the performance of, the, of this steel and better are the so-called uh, irregularities following po various post oil heat treatment. So I would say that uh, the, cooling should be controlled or the cooling should be uh, uh, below MF temperature uh, or which is 91 degrees centigrade or 200 degree Fahrenheit and that gives you the maximum reliability in terms of the you know post weld heat treatment and subsequent subsequent uh, properties down the road. Next question is that API 934 E required grain fine grain practice certification for pipe fittings also if minimum aluminum content is less than 0.02% <clears throat> then grain size requirement is mandatory to be performed using MACWI DEN test. Majority of the supplier tend to miss this requirement. Well, uh, uh, basically what happens that uh, you need to specify the grain size and grains uh, API 934E, I mean, uh, it is not possible for 934E to uh, adopt each and every requirement. So certain ASTM specification also needs to be followed. So uh, definitely speaking, uh, yes, if it is to be performed, it has to be performed and you need to for, uh, bring that out uh, to the, you know, uh, 
uh, to your supplier so that uh, they do not miss that. But grain size requirements should be uh, typically as per the ASTM. And I understand that the, the particular standard is referred in uh, API specifications, and we need to spe uh, stipulate that during the grain size. Uh, uh, we need to stipulate that uh, requirement for grain size measurement in the purchase contract. Uh, next question is from Mr. Gyanjit Mohanty, he says, ND required after post well heat treatment or before post well heat treatment, uh, pre please give any standard uh, reference. Well, this is as uh, uh, okay, uh, this is as per uh, your design specifications or an adopted uh, RPs. Generally speaking, uh, if the vessel uh, if you go as per ASME, ASME will tell you that uh, ND, you do the ND before post well heat treatment. But if you go as per API, API will tell you that do ND as per, um, you know, the final post well heat treatment. So if that is the case, you have to incorporate if the, if the vessel calls for final post well heat treatment and in, I mean ND after final post well heat treatment, you, have, you may have to do an ND uh, um, operation before uh, the post well heat treatment. So whether uh, it is to be done before or after, that is as per the standard you adopt. Typically, if you go by the, by the ASME code, the ND requirement is before post well heat treatment. And as per API and other client specification, it is after post well heat treatment, but it needs to be specified clearly in the drawing or the design documents. Uh, next question is for Mr. Stephen Raj. He says that for uh, duplex to duplex uh, gut welding joints using two five. Uh, Two, uh, 2594 filler well. I'm not sure exactly what, he, what he's asking, but yes, uh, 2594 is basically the filler well which is recommended for, say, duplex 22507. So if you're using 2507 uh, as the material for, I mean, 2507 is. <coughs> is one of the super duplex grade and that is uh, this 2594 uh, filler is recommended for that particular material. And uh, his next question is that for the above mentioned welding, how to achieve ferrite level uh, in the weld above 40%? Uh, well, uh, it is, uh, I mean, uh, there is no I will say the magic trick involved in uh, uh, to, to this. I mean, basically there is no one uh, uh, one line answer to this. So basically, what you have to do is that yes, you need to control your uh, I mean your interpass temperature as uh, as recommended. If you exceed the interpass temperature, say like if you are exceeding uh, the uh, I mean if you say for an example. 2507, uh, the maximum interpass temperature e mandated is 100 to 200, uh, 100 degrees centigrade to 120 degrees centigrade. If you try to stick in that parameter range, as well as your uh, control the welding heat input also, then meeting these uh, ferrite requirements shouldn't be a problem. I would say that uh, 40 to 60 percent ferrite or 40 to 50 percent ferrite is achievable in any duplex stainless steel nowadays. If you if you meet or if you kind of stick to the welding guidelines in a proper and in a systematic way, so I would think that uh, achieving these values would be possible very well. And you know, uh, if uh, Consumable selection, uh, uh, interpass te temperature control, and uh, as well as the welding heat input uh, during the adopted during welding, those are, you know, uh, I mean, those are controlled in a very meticulous manner. So, 
Uh, I would think that I, what I see out here is that these are most of the questions and I have, I hope that I have been able to answer all of those and uh, if you have anything, I would think that, yeah, if you send me uh, those questionnaires, I'll definitely take my time to answer them in the most, uh, you know, in, in, in yeah, yeah, uh, a detailed way and then get back to you, you know. When it is when it is convenient, yeah, we will uh, we will do that way. And uh, I now invite um, Ashok Malge for the vote of thanks. Oh, thank you, Krish Dr. Krishnan. Uh, it was a great honor uh, to listen to Mr. Pradeep Goswami's well tech talk on API recommended practices. Uh, 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 for the downstream oil and gas industry part two. Part one, we have heard earlier, this part two. Uh, he covered almost all the things required for a welding engineering and practice practitioners, like codes, welding processes, their limitations, dissimilar welding, SS welding, duplex and super duplex, etc., including testing requirement, guidelines, etc. It was one of the excellent technical lectures we have heard. And thanks for uh, thanks to Mr. Goswami for uh, sparing his uh, valuable time to speak to the audience across the globe. And we had about 170 plus participants in this uh, Welltech talk. I also thank all the participants who participated across the globe. Uh, and I hope they must have got a lot of technical uh, um, uh, information for their day-to-day -day activities. I also thank uh, Dr. Krishnan and his team for having organized this particular uh, uh, well tech talk so that it benefits everybody. So thank you once again, everyone, and good night, good uh, good evening, good uh, morning, wherever it is applicable. Thank you, Krishnan. Thank you, yeah, thank uh, you, Pradeep thank you, again. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll, thank you. We will plan for as Dr. Krishnan has mentioned. We'll plan again uh, similar events at a later stage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thank I you. I propose.